Good day and welcome back to the 40 OT podcast with your host, Mr. Thomas Henley, of course. Today, we are going to be talking about lower support needs autism. Now, you may be thinking to yourself, okay, Thomas, why, why are we having this particular subject? Like pretty much most of the content that you make is about sort of lower, lower support needs autistic adults. I think it would be good to try and think of some unique difficulties, unique differences that people like myself and um, our guest might experience as opposed to people who have much higher support needs. Yes. Where am I going with this? <laughs> I mean, I'm impressed. Everyone that was pretty see. good. <laughs> In the last podcast episode, we talked to Dr. Megan Neff all about autism and sleep. It was a very informative one, so I highly recommend going and checking that one out later. And of course, today, we, for the third time, actually, we're doing a live podcast. So if you're listening to this on any of the platforms and you want to join in on the live or you want to watch some of the live recordings from the past, um, you can have it head over to YouTube. And if you want to see the, the prior recordings, you can peruse the, the member section if you would like to do that and you want to support me. Anyway, enough rambling. How are you doing today? neurodivergent. I'm great. I'm glad that we finally made this happen. It's been like a month in the making, two months in the making. I don't know how long have we been going back and forth, like two autistic people <laughs> trying to set this up. You reached out and then I gave it the good old, you know, five to 10 business days to respond. And then you would return the favor and take five to 10 business yeah. days to respond to me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's um communication is not my strong strong suit and you know I, I I hold my hats up to to anybody who can like properly organize like things like this cuz it's just doing it on top of like everything else and like also also taking into account sort of messaging friends and family and and stuff like that it can be a lot sometimes you know it, it is a lot. I, I talk about that in one of my very first videos where I talk about the social deficits. And one of the things I struggle with the most, um, you know, because we talk about difficulty initiating and reciprocating social interaction as an autistic person. And I think it's very easy to picture what that's like for a child. But then, you know, what does that look like when you're an adult? Well, for me personally, that mm -hmm. means I really have difficulty responding to text messages and when people reach out to me and reciprocating there. And it's not that I don't have the time. It's that I, I don't have the energy, you know, because it only takes a few seconds mm -hmm. to respond to a message. But for me, it's a huge emotional mental task to respond to text messages and to respond to, you know, Instagram messages. And it just, it almost kind of feels like this heavy burden sitting in your inbox. But anyways, we, we made it happen. Here we are <laughs> two months in the yeah. making. <laughs> I think it's, I kind of describe it as like watering the plant, like particularly when it, when it comes to you, like friends and stuff like that, because a lot of people have their own sort of requirements or, or preferences when it comes to communication. And there's there's been a few times where I've had friends, um sort of made friends with somebody and or like even even in the context of, of dating to a certain degree and my texting is like maybe maybe during like I'll reply during the same day or like maybe the next day. Um because like the the pressure I think it's I think it's definitely due due to like my focus style. Like I like to be focused in on something that I'm doing um, throughout the day. I've got a routine that I'm going through and stepping away to do something else and text people, even if it's just for like a little bit. It kind of pulls me out of that that focus style. Yeah, a little bit kind of dysregulates me a bit. Yep. And then you well, open um, up the floodgates for them to text you back, and then it, when does it end too? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah it's, it's not like it's a one and done job right it's, it's a constant stream of <laughs> let me so get back to my now, special interest you're gonna get another one. <laughs> 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 oh my god well um for, 
I'm I'm seeing a lot in the chat that a lot of people have seen seen your work already oh, cool. on YouTube. But I would really like to ask for perhaps any anybody who hasn't hasn't seen you and the kind of work that you've done. Um, who is neurodivergent? How do, how do I say it? How do you want me to say that? <laughs> That's how people normally say it. Um, okay. So, what kind of content do you create as well? <laughs> so my my channel is mainly autism and ADHD content um, because I have the dual diagnosis, which is very common. Um, I think estimates are sitting at 50 to 80 percent of people diagnosed with autism also have the comorbidity of ADHD. Um, and so there's a lot of channels out there that focus on autism specifically, but um, not as many that I've seen that, you know, kind of hone in on autism and ADHD. We call ourselves ADHDers. Um, and which is kind of shorthand for, you know, the two coming together. And I've felt, uh, I, I'd felt different my whole entire life. I mean, I just can't even begin to really express how different I've felt my whole life, but I just never knew why. And, um, then I had a son in 2012 and my husband and I always knew that he was a little bit different. Um, he would mm -hmm. line up his toys and he didn't really play imaginatively with his toys. I've actually got pictures of him lining up like his Crayolas. He, he would parallel play with other children instead of playing with them. And he had a lot of, uh, what I now know to be stems and, and mannerisms with his, his hands and, you know, the hand flapping and stuff like that. Um, and it wasn't until I think, you know, and, and in kindergarten, his teacher was like, we're, you know, a little bit concerned, you know, here are some of our, our concerns, but it wasn't until he was in first grade that his teacher actually pulled us aside and asked him if we'd ever had him evaluated for autism. And, mm -hmm. you know, just to be like very what kind of age was that? Uh, so he would have been about seven years old, I believe in first grade. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, when she, about the same age as me, wow, that's when you were diagnosed that early. I was diagnosed at 10. Oh my <laughs> goodness. Wow. Yeah. So that's, um, you know, and, and obviously it's diagnosed much more in males and, um, specifically, you know, white males. And so my son falls in that category and, um, but I do remember thinking when she asked me that I thought that she was calling my son stupid because I knew nothing about autism at the time. And mm. my husband uh, was somewhat offended too, because he was like, this is going to follow him into yeah. college and stuff like that. Long story short, we researched it. We began to understand it more. This is just how little I knew about it. And he got his official diagnosis. And then one day my husband was telling me, cause bless his heart, he started researching the heck out of autism to try to understand our son and to be a good father to our son. And he found out that it was hereditary. And mm. he was telling me that a lot of the research says that it's hereditary. And it was just like the light bulb went off the world came crashing down. I was like, what are you talking about? You know? And it was at that moment that I began researching it for my, myself because I was like, maybe that's what's been going on with me my whole life. Um, so anyways, I was previously diagnosed with ADHD and then, um, thought that I was misdiagnosed with ADHD, went in to seek a professional diagnosis for autism, walked out with the diagnosis of both autism and ADHD, which I didn't even know was possible. Um, but once I began to research it, it explained my whole entire life and every little quirk and strange feeling I've had. I started watching other YouTubers and was like, holy crap, there's other people out there like me. I thought I was the only one. And so in order to process my diagnosis and to kind of like share my story, I decided to do a YouTube channel 
and I put my first video out there actually in a- April of last year. Um, didn't even film it correctly. I filmed it like <laughs> vertically instead of horizontally. Um, and I've just kind nice. of been doing, but I was like, you know what? No, we're just going to, we're, we're going to publish it, but I've been doing that ever since. So that was, that's kind of my story is I've been enjoying, um, hmm. researching and, you know, being a part of this community and putting YouTube videos out there whenever I have time. It's interesting that you, thank you for sharing that. It's interesting that, um, you were saying about how, when, uh, you, you say your, your son's teachers sort of told, um, told you and your husband about autism and stuff. And it was kind of like taken as like an insult. I think that, that tends to be the re- the reaction of a lot of people. I think when I was talking to my mom about my autism diagnosis, you know, the same sort of thoughts went on in, in both of my parents' heads as well. It was kind of like, oh my God, is this, I mean, we didn't quite get to the hereditary stage. I think that's one, one thing that's been, <laughs> hasn't been delved into too much by my parents, but yeah, I mean, they, they were worried that I was going to have a label that was going to sort of stop me from progressing. And so they like put off the diagnosis and, um, Eventually they, they went for it and they kind of told me that they phrased it in a, in a way of it being like a difference and something that, you know, I'm going to have some struggles in life and I'm also going to have some things that I'm good at and the way that my brain works is a bit different. And I imagine, I remember even at that very, very young age that it was quite impactful on me in, in what I experienced. I didn't, you know, I, I already could tell that there was something different about myself even at that young age but yeah it's 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 an interesting one there definitely needs to be more like education around autism because uh, the 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 reaction of you know taking it as a kind of like a, an insult because because of the stigma and stuff that's around it i think is something that's something that i've experienced too yeah with people and we have very different stories because you've kind of grown up knowing this fact about yourself and I was late diagnosed looking back at my life and you know it's just like watching Sixth Sense for the second time and like picking up all the things that you missed (laughs) along the way. Second teenagehood. (laughs) Yeah just looking back and being like oh well that explained that that explained that that's why that was that way so um, yeah, and, and, you know, completely, uh, I, I give so much grace to people who didn't understand and currently don't understand because I was right there. Um, and so I think, you know, sure. th- yeah, I, I totally extend grace to people who, who don't get it because that was me, you know? Totally, totally. Like, um, I, I, I think having a degree of, like patience and understanding it's like specifically when it comes to like the kind of socio political world of autism, like there's a lot of preferences that people have around language and the way that you talk about autism. And I think some, some people can be a bit like bitey towards other people, but I think it's always worth to extend some, some level of patience because a lot of people are not, it's usually a result of ignorance and usually it's not sort of willful ignorance. It's just a result of just not coming across it, not having the means or the, 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 the ignition to, to go and learn a bit more about it. Right. So I, I really, I really admire that about you. That's, that's, that's also, you know, something that I feel we we should have more of. Well, I always, <laughs> try to say, you know, one of my favorite sayings is don't attribute to malice what might be attributable to ignorance. And I think that that's Mm. just what a lot of people are dealing with. But you're, you're right. And, you know, I think that the terminology piece was kind of a great segue even into kind of how we talk about autism in, you know, our own community. And I do think that you know, because you, you have like the so-called autism moms and, you know, you've got the Mm. later diagnosed adults and you've got like high support needs and lower support needs. 
And while this feels like a topic that's been done a lot of times before, I would venture to say that um, I, I feel like there's actually a lot of nuance in, you know, what we call lower support needs adults, because a lot of times people think that that means you have like no needs, you know, yeah. um, and that the is keywords lower. It's not. <laughs> non it's not low it's it's lower correct <laughs> yes lower <laughs> <laughs> well um yes i think that is a, a a good segue i think it would be good for us to perhaps talk about uh, s some of the more the more unique challenges that lower support needs individuals might face because autism has been split into a lot of different things i think one of the more recent updates to the DSM has sort of compiled all of the the floating diagnoses into one um, ASD one, two and three based on the strength of traits that someone displays and also their functionality, what kind of support they need. There are many things that high support need individuals face that perhaps myself and you may may not or may maybe not to to a certain extent. Uh, but we are of course talking today about the unique challenges. So um, what what do you think, if you could, if we could have a little, little bit of dialogue around it, um, what kind of unique challenges do you think exist primarily for those who are lower support needs? Uh, lower support needs? Oh yeah, duh. So <laughs> my brain processed that as higher support needs. Um, anyways, so I think one of the biggest issues that I struggle with personally is that I seem, um, normal enough, and I say normal in air quotes, that people don't think that I have any needs, but I'm still uncanny valley enough and don't quite fit in anywhere. Um, and, and so it's just like I'm, I'm, I constantly feel stuck in the middle. Like I don't belong mm -hmm. anywhere. Um, because people can always tell that there's something off about me and I definitely struggle in the social communication and interaction category. But, um, you know, if, if you are a higher support needs individual, then people are automatically going to recognize, uh, why you are, you know, the way that you are, why you act a certain way, because there's an explanation for it. But when mm -hmm. you are, you know, um, and I know that People don't like using functioning labels, but I'm going to go ahead and use them so that we can convey concepts and ideas because there's no other way to do that without using words. So if you guys are offended by functioning labels, I apologize. But like for a more high functioning um, individual, you know, a, a lot of the things <clears throat> I think another issue is that, you know, if you have a higher level of intelligence, you know, people think that you should just be able to. Mm get on just fine. Um, but studies have shown that you can have a really high, you know, level of intelligence, you could have gone to college, you could do really well in school. But if you aren't able to get on socially, you are still not going to have the same career opportunities, the same yeah. advancement opportunities, this, you know, I mean, the social communication and interaction challenges that we face are just huge, but people think that they shouldn't exist because, well, you can put full sentences together. You can interact. Um, and I think people forget too, yes. that there's a whole, this whole caveat of people on the spectrum that are in the middle. You know, so many people think that you're either, lower you know other. lower level of intelligence or you are the uh sheldon cooper theoretical physicist doing math on chalkboards and it's like actually <laughs> most of us are just in the middle and we're regular people mm -hmm. with a regular amount of intelligence you know what i'm saying totally. um so it's it's just like yeah being stuck in the middle i guess i would say that that's the issue like i can, I can definitely see this the impact of it particularly sort of within the workplace because albeit probably most organizations would like to say that they are you know they, they hire people based on merit but the interview stage is there for a reason it's to like see what kind of person you are and 
quite often people make a lot of thin slice judgments about autistic people. Um, they interpret some of our outward presentations and autistic traits as negative personality traits, like our eye contact as being perhaps a bit aloof, uninterested, unfocused, or um, shifty or shady or unsociable or anxious. You know, people can interpret that aspect of our, um, those aspects of our being as negative personality traits, which is, um, and, and also when you, when you were talking about, you know, pe people sort of making assumptions about like what your needs are, I think that's also something that, um, I've ex experienced quite a lot. You know, it's, it's quite, quite difficult to get people to, to understand that some areas in life is just way too hard for you. Like for me, the social, emotional communicational aspects of autism isn't something that I have a lot of difficulties with um, when it comes to presenting, when it comes to like doing speeches and things of that nature. But people, people see that and then they assume that everything else in every different category of my, my functioning is the same. Like it's, they, they don't understand the concept of a spiky profile. Yeah. It's either I'm, especially in the workplace it's either i am a vulnerable autistic person who needs to be kind of coddled or i'm completely exceptional in all of these different areas and there's like no in between right because i do struggle a lot with those executive functioning aspects of life and it's not really something that a lot of people can kind of wrap their heads around just by speaking to me right um so yeah 100 100 percent um I think that there was some something else that you, you said you mentioned about oh yeah in school sort of the the intelligence aspect of it. Um, I think that 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 is another thing because you know the school system is very focused on getting results and like making sure that the the kids do as well in school as possible. And when you are doing well in school, they don't tend to pay a lot of attention to you. And like what your your needs are and things like that. And you're right, you know, quite often a lot of the kids that I that I used to teach, um, they would have very, very high levels of like logic and intelligence and um skills in various subjects, but at the same time they really struggled with the social emotional side of stuff. Yep. And they do typically talk about that's one of the reasons why girls get missed too, you know, um, is because they're not typically being the troublemakers. They're just the quiet, you know, girls, but this applies to boys too. <clears throat> but if they're not causing issues and being troublemakers, it's usually the, you know, squeaky wheel that gets greased or whatever that thing is. Um, and, yeah. and so, you know, there's, there's this whole, um, swath of, children that are just getting ignored and getting missed if they're well behaved and doing okay in school and making good grades. And I know that that probably applies to a lot of people. And yes, absolutely. With the spiky profile, that is absolutely a thing. Um, I talked about how like, you know, growing up, my brother used to show me off to people because I could do these little like slide puzzles within seconds at a very young age. I played violin by ear. Um, you know, I was, I, I won statewide essays. I was very good with English, but then I, I, I couldn't tell time on a clock. I was mm. years behind in math. And so, you know, that translates into like you were talking about, like, you, if people see you do as an adult, they see you do okay in one area. They assume that you do okay in every area. Or like you said, or they might tend to swing to the other side and infantilize you and stuff like that. So it's, it's, it's tough. Um, and I'm not claiming to, you know, have the same struggles as like a higher support needs person at all. Um, but no, we of course. definitely need to be recognized for having some needs. <laughs> I think, um, perhaps another one there would be under not having a diagnosis i think that's one thing like part partly due to this uh, it being kind of invisible to a lot of people or not easily picked up on um it can lead 
a lot of us to to sort of go through life not not actually having that diagnosis not realizing that we're autistic and we have these needs and um you know i think i think it comes under the the sort of label of like masking and things like that and i do want to touch on that but i think as well when it comes to actually getting support i think one of the the biggest questions or like worries or concerns that people have is you know they they go for all of this effort to kind of go for a diagnosis or you know self identify or or whatever way they want to go about it and they're thinking okay so if i do this what what is it going to do other than tell me that i'm officially autistic or, or something like that on the diagnosis is there any actual supports that i can get and the majority of the support in the uk is like there's a lot before you're 18 there's very minimal up until the age of about 25 but after that there's depending on where you live there's a very variable degree of what you can actually access in terms of support yeah having having a diagnosis i think you know absolutely matters um even outside of support needs but just like externally but like the support you're able to provide yourself and the patients and understanding that you're able to have for yourself afterward too, you know, um, because I did have all of the same struggles before my diagnosis with, you know, um, noise bothering me. And I just really thought that that made, I was just like an angry old lady stuck in a young person's body because i didn't understand why noises well, you, you think like everyone's the same <laughs> like everyone experiences the same but they're just like so i did not i knew that i knew everybody didn't have the same struggles that i did i just didn't know why you know i just i thought i was i just thought i was a bad person making bad decisions and just choosing to let noise bother me and just choosing mm. to you know be bothered by lights you know i it sounds stupid, but that's how it was for me. And so um, I was able to make accommodations for myself, like wearing loop earplugs and, um, you know, wearing sunglasses if I need to after getting my diagnosis and understanding why I am the way that I am. And I was able to start, you know, setting some boundaries and limiting some of my social interactions and stuff like that, um, which is super important, um, you know. And, and as far as like, you know, uh, accommodations go for like in the workplace and schools and stuff like that. I actually haven't had to deal too much with that, but I feel like I'm pretty easygoing. I feel like all I would ask people is like patience and knowing like, mm -hmm. hey, I probably, you know, if I had to go back and work in an office again, I may not want to go out to after work drinks with you guys, but please don't take it personally. It's because I'm spent and you know, I don't want to hang out with you. I just, I just need patience and grace. Like that's all the accommodations I'm asking for is patience and grace, but you know, I, it's going to differ from person to person, but just having that level of understanding, um, it's pretty huge for me. The lack of judgment kind of <laughs> attitude. It don't, don't make initial, initial judgments. You know, I think there was, there was something that we we're talking about in a, a previous stream like the the difficulty of i think i think for a lot of us we can explain explain ourselves and explain why people make might make might make some perceptions of us but a lot of people don't like bring it up like if we, if there's some kind of miscommunication or someone's interpreted something in, in a way there's not it's not very often unless they're a very direct person that they'll outright say it and allow you to sort of explain why that difference has happened in a sense. Yeah. I think as, as, as well, I think there was something that you, you mentioned about self-advocacy and, um, I think that that, that can be quite, quite a tall task. Cause even if you do have a diagnosis and you can show people sort of on paper, look, I am autistic. Uh, some people don't want to hear it. Some people just, it doesn't add up in their brain. They don't want to accept that you're autistic. You know, that, that kind of cognitive dissonance occurs for them when they look at you and then they think of someone that they know who has a, a perhaps high support needs child or individual that's under their care. And um, to some people, it can kind of come across as like 
solve an offense or, or, or inappropriate or they just don't want to they just they don't want to accept it and and so actually going ahead and like advocating for yourself and getting your needs met sometimes can be a really really tall task i think well and i can say for me personally most of my family does not know about my diagnosis because um i i i you know especially like older generations unfortunately they think of autism as one way, which is like the high support needs. And um, so I feel like there would probably be some disbelief there because the people that know me best have seen me masking my whole life. They don't see the real me behind closed doors. And so, you know, it's just one of those things that, you know, like, honestly, most, most of the people in my life don't even know that I have this YouTube channel. Um, not that I'm like secretive about it or hiding it from them, but it's just, you know, it's a lot to explain to somebody who doesn't understand um, hmm. what that looks like. So to be honest with you, like, you know, me personally, I, I haven't even really, there's a few, few people in my family that knows my sister knows. I think that's about it. <laughs> well, yeah. It's very, very different to me. Every, everybody that I know knows that I am. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's and like, see, again, no that's, that, yeah. um, you know, being diagnosed younger probably afforded you that, you know. And so for me, not getting mm. diagnosed until I was 39 years old, um, my friends, colleagues, family, connections, they've all seen the masked version of myself. And so it would be, you know, kind of hard to explain. But I do think people are kind of, you know, beginning to learn more about it. And, you know, uh, awareness is is spreading. And people, I think, are having a lot more patience with, you know, trying to understand some of these different pathologies, if you will, which is which is great, because it definitely wasn't like that when, you know, I was growing up in the 80s and 90s. It wasn't mm. as like accepting as it as people are now. I would guess I would say so. So we're we're making some changes in an upward trend. I feel like in in the right direction. It's just going to take us quite a while to get there. Well, um, I did mention about like autistic masking at one point, and what is uh, masking is something that tends to be quite a large component of a lot of people, especially late diagnosed individuals sort of throughout their life. And imagine it's something that perhaps um, lowest support needs individuals might sort of experience a little bit more. So I think it would be worth to talk about. And what, what kind of impact do you think that this kind of masking has on a person's well-being and like I, I can imagine that you, you've got some some experiences with that. Oh, yeah. I've had a lot of practice, you know. Um, I think we take a huge mental toll from internalizing our struggles, you know, because they're unseen. And mm. I think that masking is a constant cognitive effort that is another thing that is unseen that leads to real-life exhaustion and, um, you know, I always hear people saying, well, you know, everybody masks, you know, if uh, somebody's at a professional conference, they're going to act differently than they would at home. And to a certain extent, yes, that's true with neurotypicals, they might act differently in different situations. But for a diagnosed autistic person, it is um, constant. It in, you know, we are hiding who we are. We're not just acting socially appropriate for the social situation. We are literally trying to hide how different we feel and trying to put on a human suit <laughs> and feel less alien um, and to fit in. And again, that's not because we care what for, for most autistic people, that it's not actually a so, social motivation cause. It's a survival mechanism that they're just yeah, trying. Protection. Yeah, just trying to survive. So for autistic people, the mask is something that they wear almost all the time. And they are 
hardly ever to, able to put it down and it's absolutely exhausting. And, um, it, it definitely takes a mental toll, uh, on mm. your perception of yourself. And it takes a physical toll in regard to exhaustion. And um, it has a lot of effects on the individual by masking all mm. the time, for sure. Yeah. I think, um, you know, another aspect of that kind of masking is sort of self, self-perception, self-identity. I think for, for a lot of people who have been masking for a long time. They even do it somewhat to themselves, I guess. And I haven't experienced masking throughout my all, my entire life, but so for a long time, probably up into my late teens, I didn't mask at all. Um, I under under sort of the umbrella of social camouflage, you have compensation, assimilation, and masking. And masking is that kind of hiding of yourself in in front of other people um but what i did is i i compensated so the way that i compensated was by avoiding social interaction and uh, being very very quiet and that that was kind of the way that i sort of hid myself a little bit just by not really engaging with people as much uh, but when i went into my my 20s when i went to university Quickly found out it's quite hard to make friends <laughs> as an adult. It's quite hard to like go dating, find, find a relationship as an adult. And I had a lot of insecurities about myself and, and how I presented. And, um, I started, started masking during, during that time. And it really had a real negative impact on me because it's, it's, you, you kind of, some degree it's it's like the whole whole thing with people like faking it to they make it kind of thing and that's that mentality kind of embedded itself within me a little bit and it just led led to me masking and made social interaction just very stressful as you said because it's like when you are masking you're changing your body language your facial expressions what you talk about aspects of your personality um, all of those different things at the same time as trying to communicate and process what, what someone's saying to you yep. and producing a response, you know? So it's the energy demand of a social situation just skyrockets. Yeah. Um, and it makes it very un unenjoyable. You yeah. You can't really enjoy it as much. Yeah. You, you really nailed um, it when you talked about, you know, all the things that we have to be mindful of and pay attention to what they're saying like <laughs> yeah <laughs> multitasking it's real, it's real hard man this is really really hard but that yeah. might be my adhd kicking in <laughs> <laughs> i think when it comes to unmasking as well like i think i think you mentioned them that you haven't really sort of unmasked around people um I've heard, heard heard from a lot of people who have started to unmask that the responses from people around them, their family, and I even have experienced it to a certain degree, is that people say that you're trying to put on being autistic. It's because because you're obviously making this this kind of flick of the switch thing, and you're you're taking off the the mask. People see that as you trying to put on that you're autistic. You know, because they know you as that person. Yeah, I did a whole video on that. And um, it's actually one of my more favorite videos. It's not my best performing video, but it's, you know, one of my favorites. And mm. it's uh, called, I, I think I called it the Autism Actor Awards. And in that video, I talk about how after you get a diagnosis, people can absolutely start perceiving you as acting more autistic because um, you start unmasking a little bit and accommodating mm -hmm. yourself a little bit more. But really what they don't realize is that it was the whole time before your diagnosis, or at least for us eight late diagnosed people, I can only speak for that, um, that it was before 
that you were doing all the mm. acting. Now mm. you're trying to stop acting so much and they think that you are now you're doing acting. the acting, <laughs> <laughs> you know? So, um, and you know, there's a, a, a frequency illusion that plays into it and recency illusions that, you know, if you, of course, after you get diagnosed and you start making all these connections about why you are the way that you are and you start having an explanation for all the weird quirks and behaviors and way, you know, that you think. And so you start even talking about it more. And then, you know, people are going to yeah. think that you're just, you know, again, um, putting on a show when really you're just starting to make sense of your life for the first time. Again, this mm. is obviously going to resonate more with later diagnosed people. Um, so, yeah, that's a thing. <laughs> no, I, well, I, I can imagine. And it's it's difficult, isn't it? Because, you know, um, th there are partic particular people out there who feel very, very strongly about sort of diagnose like is specifically something that happens when someone self identifies as as autistic they people can get very ups, upset at upset at them because of it i think a really good thing to point out around sort of autism and adhd and, and pretty much anything related to psychology is that you know the system sort of creates categories to to categories and boundaries to put people into and diagnosis in itself is very variable on its accuracy yeah. like <laughs> that is it's not very comfortable to hear but um the the variability on, on how accurate people can like diagnose depression is not as high as you think because um th there needs to be some degree of sort of trusting what people say about their experiences because it's not like you can put on a brain analyzer and jump into their skin and just like see the world as as they do or you know so th there's all, all of those elements to it and i think you know i think just just being aware of that and just especially when it comes to making judgments about people online who you haven't met in person i think it's important not to jump to conclusions about whether someone's autistic or not or really autistic or not because it's a very very um complex thing and it, it does require a lot of you know trust i don't know what, why i'm talking about this just kind of doing a bit of a ramble <laughs> <laughs> that's what we do <laughs> it's a yeah. it's a it's a good conversation to have um i don't know maybe someday elon musk will come out with Neuralink <laughs> to uh, you know, help us autistic people, um, you know, may maybe they'll come up with an app that, that will allow, uh, like a neurodivergent translator app. Like you just talk into it and then it spits out neurotypical language that they can understand <laughs> us. <laughs> Get on it. Elon or, e or even a, or even a, a device. I I'd probably call it the device. Um, step step into their shoes yeah. device where you can just like put on like a piece of headgear and just like swap bodies for a second or like feel the emotions that someone has experiencing something like that that, that would cool. freak a lot of people out if they had to step into an autistic yeah. person's <laughs> shoes and think how we think for a little bit they'd be like that was awful i don't ever want to do that again yeah i think as well like People with like mental illness as well. I think that would be quite a big, a big jump if, if someone actually made something like that. You could actually <laughs> help, like, let people get into the mind of and, and experience the feelings of being mentally ill just yeah. so that they know that it's real. Like, yeah. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Get on um, it, Elon Musk. <laughs> yeah. Get on it. Well, um, I've got one, one sort of topic of, questions to go down is it's the one that i i told you about before we got started but i think it's it'd be important to talk about in the context of speaking about unique sort of lower support needs adults experiences um because i've seen a lot of as, as you know in social media like the autism 
community is like growing at a exponential rate in all different spheres and with that increase in people seeing that stuff um you're obviously going to to get some detractors you get it with any sort of diversity related movement and there has been sort of a point of contention between two sides of the communities um being the autistic adults um the autism parents advocates and at the moment i've seen some people talk about um sort of use this phrase phraseology they used to use the words severe autism now they use profound autism and they sort mm. of i don't really know how to explain it but they sort of see a lot of the work that autism advocates like ourselves and, and other people online um doing so, sort of overshadowing the experiences of of higher support needs individuals so do you think do you think that our advocacy work sort of overshadows those high support needs individuals it's a very tough so <laughs> i i love that you are asking this question because we we need to be having more of these difficult discussions and what mm. i say is that I think we all just need to lend each other a little bit more compassion because, you know, on, on both sides, because the parents with high support needs children, um, you know, it's, it's an, unpo it's an unpopular opinion to say, you know, that there are some parents who are, you know, wanting people to feel sorry for them, you know, um, and, feeling like their child is a burden. Um, but it is, it has to be so difficult. I could not imagine for one moment having to have a child that it's difficult to leave the house or go to a store. Hmm. And I see a lot of people, you know, that are in the higher support needs, you know, will never understand what it's like to be in their shoes and to live a, a, every day with a nonverbal child or a child that, um, you know, every parent has a child because they want to send them out into the world to be productive citizens and, and to have a family and to go and live their own lives. And they have hopes and dreams for their and children and yeah. to experience life. And uh, if you have a, you know, real high support needs child, they, all those, you know, dreams for your child are lost. You still love them, but that's got to be a really hard and heavy burden to, uh, burden maybe the wrong choice of words. But I don't think, I think that there's a lot of things that none of us will ever fully understand from a personal level yeah. without living in their shoes. Now, are there a lot of crappy, uh, <laughs> parents out there who are like, woe is me, feel sorry for me, like, screw my child, but like, feel sorry for me. Yes, there are. Um, and those aren't the ones that I'm, I'm talking about here. Um, and then on the other side, you know, I think that these parents need to understand that we have real needs as well, and that they will never mm. fully understand what it's like to walk in our shoes, and to be told that, you're smart, so you should be able to get on in the world just fine. Um, there's nothing wrong with you. Uh, you know, they don't understand the exhaustion that we're literally living through every day, just trying to do simple tasks like executive functioning and responding to text messages and, um, you know, the exhaustion that we feel with uh, social interactions um, how, you know, the suicide rate is very high in the autism community. Why is that? Yeah. It's not because we're doing okay. It's because we're struggling. So I think on the other side of the coin, these, um, parents need to understand and recognize that we have real struggles too. And it's not a fixed pie. We're not, um, there isn't only so much support that can exist, you know, that if, if we say we need some support, that that takes away support mm. from you or your child. Um, 
there's enough to go around. It's not a fixed pie. And I think that we really it's just... It's a different type of support quite often yes, as well. Yeah. And so I, I just think that um, compassion and just trying to imagine what it might be like to live in another person's shoes and mm. to listen would be really, really helpful. So, no, we're not trying to take anything away from them. We're just trying to share our experience. And our experience mm. is our experience. Period. <laughs> Indeed. Yeah. I, I, I very much... Very much agree with you. I think being being in the online spaces, I think m- more than more than ever, from from what I've seen, there tends to be a lot of fighting and controversy happening in all areas of the internet. And I think I'm seeing a lot more of that kind of stuff nowadays. I think one of the the the, the difficult parts of it is trying to sort of convert people into not thinking it as a, as a this or that thing and just just being aware that like it's that there is differences between between people and you know it's going to it's going to vary in in how it progresses and what you said particularly about sort of the the suicide rates like the level of mental mental health comorbidities and addiction and um struggles with work and you know, everything like that it can be something that a lot of autistic people have a lot of difficulty with so lower support needs individuals as as well and it was definitely so, yeah, affected it's... by the fact that they took away the term asperger's and you know mm. uh, put it in with autism and i know that we're just touching on all the hot topic issues here but <laughs> You know, that's going to take a lot of time for people to catch up to and understand as well. And um, Mm -hmm. I do think that it is very interesting. I will say this, that we have eight different types of narcissism that have very different, distinct categorizations of traits. We have different types of ADHD. We have different Mm -hmm. types of anxiety but Mm. then they're trying to lump everything into one umbrella of autism when we can all look very very different and so i think that's you know worth communicating to people too that uh, you know we need to extend more grace in that area because when we have these minute categories of all these different pathologies that people get handed but autism with its many different facets is all just squished under one label. I think that it's yeah. easy for people to understand too why some might say like, Oh, you have real autism and you don't have real autism. You know, what are the real yeah. autistics? I don't know. <laughs> um, so I, I understand. Um, but I think that, you know, there are some people out there who, just, you know, there's, there's crappy people out there too. You know, let's just say it like there's mean people out there. There's angry people out there and we're probably (laughs) in every group. Right. And we're probably never going to change their minds. So, (laughs) yeah, I think what, what I've seen particularly, there was a, what kind of sparks my interest in, in talking about this was a podcast that I reacted to by creator called book angel who does a lot of stuff around trans things I'm, I'm like, familiar. There's a lot of um yeah the, there seems to be some level of like controversy around them but they had someone on the podcast talking about autism and i've seen it a lot particularly in with people who kind of look, look down on like autistic adults like ourselves talking about our experiences as seeing it as like an aesthetic or a fashion label or like something cool and quirky like that we're just trying to put out Um, because they see a lot of people talking about you know the positives and sort of the whole social model and you know speaking about all of those things and and their perception of it of our experience with autism is comes from like reels and tiktoks and like you know just just autistic people living their lives but they they don't. They, they they see it as that, and they kind of group it under this any particular label that works, like Gen Zers or like young young people, or you know. Um, 
I mean, it's it's just completely. It doesn't make any sense anyway because I think the autistic community, from what I've gathered, is made up of people who are not in that age dynamic, age di- dynamic, dynamic demographic. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. I think as well. I and Sorry, I, I can ha- I can have an understanding for that, you know, like because yes, it, it's it's the TikTok generation, right? And there are a lot of people who I mean, well, not a lot of people. I, I do think that there are perhaps some people out there who might think it's a trendy label, but not really. I think most of the people like us, you know, I didn't diagnose myself after watching one TikTok. I diagnosed no. myself yeah. after. Um, months and months and months of research and going to talk to an actual mental health professional and um, recognizing all of these traits that line up perfectly with the um, autism and ADHD diagnosis and really doing a lot of reflecting and researching. I didn't come to this conclusion after watching a TikTok. And I One don't really TikTok. know yeah. a ton of people out there who who are. Um, all these kids watching TikTok and diagnosing themselves because of an Instagram post. Or Damn kids! Like, really? <laughs> no, really? Is that what you think people are doing? It's like maybe there are some people, but I, you could say that for pretty any any pretty much any demographic or group or anything. Like, yeah, and you know um, what? Gonna I'm gonna people, I'm gonna keep but... um I'm I'm gonna keep doing videos and I'm going to, you know, and, and I'm going to keep showing people what autism can look like, um, and how we experience the world. Uh, I'm not going to worry about, you know, any haters that say you're not really autistic, uh, because we need more voices to speak up and show people Mm. what it can look like. You know, it can look like somebody like me. It can look like somebody like you. And a lot of the other, you know, adult autistic people speaking up um, because we exist, we're out there. And, and, you know, as as long as we continue to share our stories, we can, you know, start getting more people to like, Mm. see, see that this it could look like this, too. It's not just level three people that require substantial support, you know, so I'm going to keep sharing my story. (laughs) As, as well, maybe to not playing devil's advocate, but perhaps looking particularly at like the other side when it comes to wasn't and parents. I do want to put this out there that like I do have, like I do, I do understand it as well where, when it comes to like social experiences with people outside in the world. You can have a lot of like other, other parents sort of making judgments about them or their, their children. There, there's been a lot of stigma, I think, also for autism parents particularly around like refrigerator mother hypothesis and um, various things like that so it's definitely not that because i'm talking about my experiences i'm talking specifically about you know perhaps lower support needs individuals does not mean that i'm like ignoring the other the other you know other groups of people um because I, I've, I've i've worked with them and i've you know, I, I understand that it can be quite difficult um, when it comes to to teaching and educating and, and also parenting, and um, that there is as well not not the best, quite often not the best kind of route routes to go down and supports available for them. So I think it's is really worth you know highlighting that it's not like this this or that kind of us versus them kind of thing. I think. You know, the, the best way to kind of view it is, you know, if we can kind of pull our efforts together to like fight and advocate for things that both groups find find difficult and obviously perhaps deviate the, the supports needed for each one of them. I think that that would be a lot more productive. Yeah, um, that was the best so we, way we really you could have said that, people. you know, <laughs> instead of um, in group division and fighting let's all work together to help one another and support one another and um that's a much better use of our efforts i would venture to say i mean that's it's not to say that like autistic autistic people like autistic adults in the community are always going to like 
get it right as well. I think I've seen a lot of um, you know, a lot, lot of bullying and confrontation of and harassment between autistic autistic adults them, themselves, sort of in the the online spaces, having different ideas about autism and preferences when it comes to language and sort of the the policing and the kind of you know di different sort of circles within you know it's like when we talk about the autistic community it's like we're speaking about a monolith but it's really an offshoot of lots and lots of different groups on various both on social media platforms and between social media platforms you know? yeah <laughs> it's a very very wide thing. I was reading um, through the comments and Ginger Blaze said, Thomas and Jen, if you were a teacher, you would notice how many more children are indeed being influenced and self-diagnosing with autism. And I, you know, think that there is some accuracy to that. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, a lot of that stems from the traits of autism being normal human traits, you know, um, hmm. when you hear someone saying like, well, you know, say like, I, I like schedules or I like routine and they're like, well, I like routine, you know, I get exhausted with social interaction and they might think like, well, I sometimes get exhausted with social interaction and yes, that can and does happen. Um, but you know, we're not aiming to pathologize everyone. We just want the people who really truly do have it to get noticed and to get diagnosed and to get the help that they need. And the ones who, you know, don't have it, then a, a good amount of education about what it really looks like, you know, would serve them well too. So I'm not saying that it's not a mm -hmm. problem because it, it absolutely can and does happen that people are, um, you know, the, the potential of over pathologize, pathologization, <laughs> it's, it does happen. Yes. Um, but you know, there's obviously a lot of genuine cases out there too. I think as well, it's, it's again, like as along the lines of what I was saying before, it's very difficult to know, like, um, especially if someone does not have a lot of training or awareness or education about autism in the first place to actually know if it is a genuine thing or not, you know, because as you said, like, you no, know, for, for a lot of people, the first steps in going and getting a diagnosis is being aware and identifying with various things related to autism. So it's, it is a very complex thing, but I, I think, you know, I think a level of, you know, just, um, understanding that it's a possibility and not i think a lot of people jump jump to sort of assuming that they're not autistic and they're kind of jumping on a trend and stuff and the, i'm not saying that there aren't people like that who do that but i think you know unless you are you know that person very well unless you sort of have the, the education to, to be able to say yes or no i think it's it's important to it's important, important to, to to sort of have this this out there, and also perhaps tem temper sort of opinions about it a little bit. But I do understand, like it's, I mean, it happens with everything, doesn't it? Like people misinterpret um, aspects that they they think that they're one thing and they're not, and you know, I do understand that. I think, you know, hopefully, in my eyes, one of the the things that we we should really be doing, particularly in the school system, is having a lot more routes to educating people about, just as you said, about you know what it can look like and what like the criteria are, and you know just having an awareness of different aspects like that, yeah. understanding a little bit about, about what masking is. I've actually been you know. invited to um, speak at my son's school about it so i hey. you know yeah so you know what i am um, we can't change the whole world and none of us should be putting that burden on ourselves um but we can do what we have the energy to do and um you know what it, it's not it's not our job to educate everyone but if we can reach one person whatever you know small steps um so mm -hmm. you know um i feel in my phone is that like 30 percent so <laughs> No, it's okay. I, I was gonna, I was gonna get things, uh, things wrapped up anyway. I just um, looked up. I was like, "Holy I think, crap!" It's 
been such I've, a great conversation. I think we've probably been <laughs> podcasting for about an hour, but we have been on stream for an hour and a half because we've been chatting and stuff before. And but one last thing that I, w- I do want to ask you before we, we try and wrap things up: what are three things if you can think of? You, I'll give you some time to think if you want that you would like wider society to know about lower support needs autistic adults um three things gosh uh, uh, again just like patience and kindness listen to us i you know n- nothing about us without us they're always saying uh, which is, is very important. You know, we get so much information from non autistic people who know somebody who's autistic or they're a medical or mental health professional that deals with autism. And they mm-hmm. certainly have a seat at the table too. But if you want to know what it's really like to live with autism, then listen to us and our experience with, you know, lower support needs and recognize that it, I I wish that people knew, you know, I guess for my third thing is that autism Mm -hmm. doesn't have a look and that all the stereotypical things people think about lower support, well, autism in general, that you're either low support needs and potentially mentally challenged, or you are a mathematical genius that can memorize an encyclopedia and (laughs) solve complex math equations in your head that Mm. we are, there are a ton of us in the middle, you know? So I guess I didn't take too long to think of those three things, (laughs) but that's what I would say. Brilliant. Thank you, Jen. So yeah, uh, if you guys have enjoyed this, please make sure to like, subscribe if you're on YouTube and consider becoming a member for as little as 99p per month. It's as low as I could put it. You get a lot of uh, badges, emojis that you can use. Uh, You get to see a lot of these uncut live streams, including this one, the streams that I do over on my YouTube channel. And if you are on any of the platforms, Spotify, Apple, Google, any of those, please make sure to give it a give it a rating. Perhaps consider following for more podcasts such as this. Jen, do you have any links that you would like to share with everybody? Uh, check me out on YouTube if you haven't already. <laughs> I think that's about it. Much more concise than mine. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm not on all I the mean... podcasts. I'm not like the cool kids. You cool kids. <laughs> You cool kids and your Apple and Spotify. Yeah, you, you bloody neurodivergent quirky people with your <laughs> online platforms and your reels and TikToks. <laughs> Get off my lawn. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh my God. Well, thank you very much. Um, it's been an absolute pleasure. And I think at some point it'll be lovely to have you on again to talk about something else because it seems to be that a lot of people are enjoying our conversation or find it useful and um, it's been an absolute pleasure i hope you have a very lovely rest of your day and i will see you in another episode thanks of the Thomas. Podcast. thanks for inviting me on it was fun see you later guys bye <laughs>